Devaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Sarvatra Meswaram Viksam Kaivayam Maniketatam Vivikta Chira Vasanam Santosam Yenikena Chit Translation, one should practice meditation by constantly seeing oneself to be an eternal, cognizant spirit soul and seeing the Lord to be the absolute controller of everything. To increase one's meditation, one should live in a secluded place and give up false attachment to one's home and household paraphernalia. Giving up the decorations of the temporary material body, one should dress himself with scraps of cloth found in rejected places or with the barks of trees. In this way, one should learn to be satisfied in any material situation. Mm -hmm. Let's see how long the purport is before we begin. Okay, good enough. Kaivalya, or living in a secluded place, indicates a place free from material disturbances. Therefore, one should live in the association of devotees. The common goal is advancement in Krishna consciousness. Especially in, the, in Kali Yuga, if one tries to remain physically isolated from all others, the result will be degradation or insanity. Aniketatam means that one should not be intoxicated by the ephemeral satisfaction of one's home sweet home, which will vanish at any moment by the unforeseen circumstances produced by one's previous activities. In this age, it is not actually possible to dress in tree bark in modern cities, nor wear scraps of cloth. Previously, Human culture accommodated those practicing us tapasi, tapasya, or penance in the interest of spiritual advancement. In this age, however, the most urgent necessity is for preaching the message of Bhagavad Gita throughout human society. Therefore, it is recommended that Vaishnavs dress with clean and neat cloth, covering the body decently so that the conditioned souls will not be frightened or repulsed by the severe penances of the Vaishnavas. In the Kali Yuga, the conditioned souls are extremely attached to material sense gratification, and extreme austerities are not appreciated, but are instead considered abominable denials of the flesh. Of course, austerity is required for spiritual advancement, but the practice, practical example set by Srila Prabhupada in successfully spreading the Krishna conscious movement was that all material things should be used to attract people to Krishna consciousness. Therefore, Vaishnavas may at times adopt ordinary dress to serve the higher principle of distributing Krishna consciousness. In any case, one should learn to be satisfied in any material situation as to prepare for the moment of death. According to Bhagavad Gita, at the time of death, the particular consciousness we have created in this life will carry us to our future situation. Therefore, human life can be seen as a type of practice for successfully fixing one's mind on the absolute truth due during the severe trials of death. Om Gyan Timidam Dasya Gina Jana Salakaya Jaksun Militam Yena Tas Mai Shri Gurvena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudamai Vajari Nirvise Sasunyavadi Vastyat Yade Satarine Vanchakal Patru Bhischa Kripa Sindhu Pei Bacha Patita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namaho Namaha 
Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasri Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So some more uh, guidelines, instructions for detaching oneself from material life. The entire process of Krishna consciousness is to detach yourself from material life, material activities, material association, and attach yourself to devotees to the process of Krishna consciousness and to Krishna. Anything that supports these two things are considered to be uh, favorable for one's progress to go back home, back to Godhead. The process of Krishna consciousness is to gradually cut away one's material attachments and replace it with attachments to Krishna and devotional service. If we are simply practicing Krishna consciousness in order to improve our material situation, we do not understand what is the actual goal and purpose of spiritual life, which is to attach yourself to Krishna. And attaching yourself to Krishna and to devotees of Krishna and the activities of Krishna consciousness bring one to the consciousness of Taktva Deham Purna Janma Janaiti Mamiti Sorjuna, going back home, back to Godhead. Here we're seeing some ways that people can adopt in order to develop detachment. We like to dress very nicely. Here it says one should give up these ideas and dress in a very simple way. Now this also applies, although the caution here is that we cannot perform such as severe austerities because our business as to preach Krishna consciousness and therefore this will become very repulsive to people in general or even frightening. <laughs> but one should learn the process of simplicity. Simplicity teaches one how to remain very happy in all situations of life. People are not happy you can just look out your window, wherever you are, cars are flying by this way and that way. People are running this way and that way. Why chasing after some ideas for happiness, thinking that they need these things in order to live. The whole material world is simply a frantic rush in order to go faster to hell. <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> Everyone's running fast to hell. And living in hell as they're approaching a bigger hell. Why? Because people don't have no idea what, who they are, and what is the goal of life, how to become happy, and uh, who is God? <laughs> what, is, what does it actually mean to become Krishna conscious or God conscious? The whole world is all is all is full of ignorance, mm -hmm. and this material world is designed to keep people in that ignorance because that's what they want. <laughs> the design fits their desires. And the design increases their desires in the same way. So to go against, to go to practice Krishna consciousness 
means to go against the grain, means to perform activities that are opposite of the way of the world. Uh, sometimes we think spiritual life means to fit in in the world in a better way. No, <laughs> it's not about that. It's about, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the, I believe it's the sixth chapter, what is night for the conditioned soul is the time of awakening for the self-realized soul. And what is time of awakening for the, and what is night for the self-realized soul is time of awakening for the, uh, for the conditioned soul. So in other words, two birds, doves and crows, we might even say swans and crows. The crown, the crows run around jumping all over the garbage, looking for pieces of food within the garbage to somehow or other find some satisfaction. And you have the new crows and the old crows. The old crows are the ones that have been doing it throughout their whole life. They're still jumping, but their jumping is much slower than it used to be. And the new crows are running full speed with wings flapping at high, at high velocity in order to extract as much so-called happiness from the garbage heap. The material world is no better than the garbage heap because there's nothing here that can satisfy. It's the refuge of sense gratification. And sense gratification is not life. Sense gratification is available in all species of life. And, but in the human form of life, it is meant to be regulated to the point of uh, uh, what is necessary to keep body and soul together. So simplicity will allow one to almost practice Krishna consciousness in a way that is very easy and pleasing. One of the, one of the fall downs in Krishna consciousness is Atyahara. Atyahara means too much eating, too much collecting material things. We see today's society, especially if you go to countries like the United States of America, along the highways, they have these huge, gigantic warehouses that people can rent in order to store their personal collections. People's houses are not big enough to cram in all the junk they collect. And so now they have these big warehouses and you can rent them. They're, they're bigger than large garages. You pay a large amount of money. You can put all your junk in there. And then when you die, someone comes to clean it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what happens. It's not an exaggeration. And so in other countries have similar types of conveniences or conveyances for uh, over collecting. And what is this over collecting is doing is just ruining the earth. They exploit the earth. You go into department stores, you go into shopping malls, the malls are stacked the highest shelf with all kinds of stuff people don't even need. Um, it, it's, it was mentioned in one lecture, they quoted some statistics that in the year 1850, you might say that's about 170 years ago, um, the possessions that people had were considered to be necessities to the, to the percentage of 95%. In other words, 95% of the things people had in the year 1850 were considered to be necessity. And 5% were considered to be extra or uh, not necessity. 
or extra. In other words, you could live without that. Now the reverse percentage is there. 90%, 95% of the things people have are junk, useless, just piling it up in their house uh, and getting more of the same thing. <laughs> They have to rent bigger apartments in order to store all this stuff, <laughs> get bigger houses. I've been in houses that are so big that you need a map, literally, to get around the house so you know all the areas of the house that are available. <laughs> garages that have four car garages. Uh, so, you know, people uh, are just insane with uh, collecting so many things. And if devotees have a similar mentality and start to think, well, yeah, I'm a devotee and Krishna is the richest. So I should also be quite, you know, well-to-do in my material life. And then that is a defect and an, an impediment in the execution of Krishna consciousness. Therefore, it says that in Krishna consciousness, there are two impediments or defects or deficiencies which curtail the success in one's execution, execution of Krishna consciousness. Having too many material possessions, having too little. Too little means I can't maintain my body. I don't have enough clothes. I don't have enough food. I don't have enough health care to maintain. If I get sick, I can't do it. In other words, too little and uh, too much. So therefore, we say Krishna consciousness is the middle road. The, the middle road means whatever you need to keep body and soul together. And that way you can maintain all of the things you have easily and you go on with Krishna consciousness nicely. Simple living, high thinking, as opposed to high living and no thinking. Too busy living to think. <laughs> Always busy trying to maintain, to get more, to protect, <clears throat> and no time for Krishna or very little time for Krishna like that. So one should be very diligent to practice this principle of simplicity in the execution of devotional service. And one will need the help of someone who knows. Therefore, we should consult others when you're not sure how much you need or don't need. <laughs> and there was one, there was one head of state in one African country. His name was Haile Selassie. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I think he was in the Congo. He was the head of the state in the Congo. And back in the 1960s or 50s, right around that time, <laughs> and uh, he was his uh, regime was overthrown by revolution I think he was killed and his wife and when they went into his wife's quarters they noticed and they they noticed that she had 3,000 pairs of shoes, 3,000 pairs of shoes. She only had two legs, but she had 3,000 pairs of shoes. <laughs> so this is insanity. <laughs> it's also raping of the resources of the earth in order to uh, somehow or other satisfy one's greed and that's being done today you'll see if you study the statistics which are not so easily available but you can find out 
that 87% of all the natural resources that are available in society are owned by three corporations. <laughs> this is today's six statistics. Three corporations own 87% of all the resources available. So this greed is a very deadly disease. It kills the human spirit and it destroys the earth and it causes one uh, to be overly afflicted with a type of activity that is destructive to oneself and to others. Therefore, devotees can learn by the mistakes of others what not to do and therefore not to fall into the same thing. So here it mentions when should dress in a certain way, but then the purport clarifies that one should dress clean, nice clothes, simple, attra attractive in the sense that they are, they are neatly arranged. And because uh, it says that one should eat to please oneself, one should dress to please others. Think about that one. This is from Chanaka Pandit, which is quoted by Srila Prabhupada. One should eat to please oneself, dress to please others. Sometimes we see the opposite, that people want to feed more and more and more. And if you don't eat, then they're not happy. But you know how much you need. So you it's always considered that the person can decide how much they want to eat and what to eat. And for dressing, well, nowadays people don't care how they look sometimes. They even look quite uh, something like something that came out of a horror movie or something that came out of a brothel. And they don't care how they dress. They think, well, it's my body. I can dress any way I want. But it says culture means a dress to please others. So we get the opposite in today's culture. So devotees should also dress, as it says here, with clean and neat cloth, covering the body decently so that the conditioned souls will not be repulsed or frightened in any way like that. So we have our recommended austerities, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meeting, no gambling, and that is the negative injunctions that one must follow. And for positive, one should be very clean, neat, chant the holy names of the Lord, um, read the scriptures daily, um, under, try to understand the scriptures, inquire how to practice the knowledge that one receives, and at the same time, should try according to one's situation how to give the same knowledge to benefit others. And that is considered to be the highest welfare work. Because it says here to serve the higher, highest, the higher principle of distributing Krishna consciousness, may one may adopt even the ordinary dress of people in general, if it facilitates the distribution of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. So um, these are all external principles because Krishna consciousness means purification of the heart, but supportive activities in devotional service such as uh, qualities and principles are important because they bring one to the stage of uh, detachment. And detachment is the foundation for attachment to Krishna. And this is what this verse is detached from one's own desires for uh, happiness and physical satisfaction through 
appearance, which is a reflection of the false ego, and attachment to Krishna by engaging, by simplifying our life in such a way that we have time, energy to execute devotional service uh, fully. Well, these are some just general principles that one should follow. And as we mentioned in the previous verses, there were so many principles listed. Here we get a little bit about dress and about cleanliness. This is also important and about the idea of using time and energy to carry on the process of Krishna consciousness. As Lord Chaitanya told the, uh, the uh, Korma Brahmana, after Korma Brahmana, after Lord Chaitanya stayed at his house in Korma Shetra for four days, the Lord left. He was served nicely and so devotionally by Korma Brahmana and his family. When the Lord was leaving, Korma Brahmana didn't find any happiness in, in the idea that he would no longer be with Lord Chaitanya. So he decided to leave his family and go with Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya turned him around and said, this is not good. You have your responsibility, stay in your family, but don't worry, you can always have my association. If you tell people about Krishna, wherever you meet, tell them about Krishna, whoever you meet, teach them to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. He said, if you do this, you'll never lose my association. So there's no, uh, we say, deficiency in any of the ashrams if one practices the principles that govern that ashram. And for Grihasta ashram, those who live in family life, charity, giving in charity is a very important part of that ashram. It detaches one from material things and it also helps to push on Krishna consciousness. And at the same time, that charity takes two forms in the form of using one's resources and one's intelligence. The intelligence means to give Krishna consciousness to others. And so Grihastas have a, usually have a greater amount of opportunity to interact with a larger, a larger body of people. So they meet many, many people through their work, through friends, through family. And so they can always somehow use this. Usually we find, and I always hear it, that uh, a devotee is practicing Krishna consciousness and their, their relatives, their friends, their in-laws are trying to dissuade them and telling them that's not good. We shouldn't allow that to go on. We should be, we should be proactive in telling them that this is what they actually need to do. <laughs> Rather than trying to defend our situation, we should use our situation to benefit them by telling them, hey, you're wasting your life. Here's where you can be happy. Here's where you can understand God. Here's where you can uh, fulfill all your desires for happiness and for success in life. <laughs> so we should be proactive in our, rather than defending our situation simply by uh, uh, when we get attacked because relatives, friends, people in general find some fault with us. Sometimes devotees are embarrassed that they are devotees. They have, they have association with people in general and they think, oh, I have to hide the fact that I'm a devotee. No, we should be proud that we are a devotee. We have the, the story, there's a beautiful story where Prabhupada tells this story. There was one huge factory where many Hindus were working at a job. Now uh, the factory was sold to one Islamic man and then he made a, a declaration. He said, now when you all come to work, you shouldn't, you cannot wear this tilak, this gopi chandan. Anyone who wears tilak or gopi chandan to work will immediately be dismissed from their job. 
So the next day, no one except one person came and they all came without tilak except this one person. And when the proprietor, the Islamic man said, you know, I was, I instructed you and you have to give this up. You, you know that? And he said, well, this is my religion. This is I'm, what I'm proud of it. I'm not giving it up. And he spoke in such a conviction that the Islamic man said, okay, all of you from now on cannot wear it except this one person. <laughs> in other words, they gave it up so easily that uh, it seemed like that they didn't really care. They, their job meant more than their, their, their culture, their, spirit, their spiritual culture. Therefore, the Islamic man was intelligent. He could see, oh, this man actually has some character. He has some values. And he stood up for his values and it was appreciated. So in the same way, we should never be, uh, what we say, afraid to be a devotee or to dress in devotional clothes when we go out. When the ladies go out, when they dress in devotional clothes, they look very, very beautiful. The men can also go out with dhoti, tilak. Um, I travel that way all the time. Um, and uh, people sometimes ask me who you are, what is your religion? Um, or sometimes people just don't talk to me, either one. But I never find any problems. And uh, because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling like I'm different. I, I just try to fit into where I am and go along with whatever I'm doing. And devotees do that also. And uh, other people might feel a little uncomfortable, but we shouldn't feel uncomfortable about ourselves. We should think, oh, this is not, as Prabhupada said, the dhoti, tilak, korta. This is the dress of the residents in the spiritual world. <laughs> and of course, the women dress very colorfully and in so many very nice ways. And that's nice. That's nice if it's kept clean, neat, and colorful. It indicates that I am a devotee of the Lord. That's a, that is actually a way to send a message to people in general. A good message, because honest people will appreciate, and fools will never appreciate anything. There's that old desert story where, where uh, Prabhupada tells this story. There was a man, old man, a young boy, and a horse. So they come into the town and the old man is riding on the horse. The young boy's walking alongside the horse and people start to respond. Oh, look at that. That young boy, he has to walk and that old man, he's on that horse. So cruel to that young boy. So they hear, so the next town they go into, the, so they switch. So the young boy goes on the horse, the old man walks alongside the horse. And so then they start coming into the next town and people say, look at this situation. This is not right. This, uh, this old man has to walk, he's old and this young boy is riding on the horse. It's cruel to the old man. So they thought, all right. So, um, so they decided to uh, uh, both get on the horse. So the next town they walked into them, they, they rode into, they're both on the horse. People are saying, just see that that poor horse he has all this weight on this poor horse. They're just making that horse suffer. So they're thinking, oh, all right, what to do? So the next town, they both decide to walk 
the, along with the horse. And people start to say, oh, just see, they have this horse and it's not even being used. What a waste of time. <laughs> so you get the message. You can't please people. You can please some of the people some of the time. You can please all of the people some of the time, but you can never please all of the people all the time. We want to please Krishna. <laughs> So if we're pleasing Krishna, then that's all it counts. Some people will be appreciated and some will not. So we have to learn how to please Krishna in everything we do. And that includes how we live our life in Krishna consciousness. Okay. Thank you. So we'll stop there. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for today's class, uh, explaining the principle of simplicity through this verse. Thank you. Um, I request devotees, please uh, go ahead and ask your questions, uh, share your comments or realizations if there are any. I also request you all please turn on the videos if possible. Thank you, Hare Krishna. You can raise your hands or unmute yourselves. Hi, Shri Devi Mataji, please go ahead. Thank you, Vinda. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances or glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for another wonderful class. Uh, explaining to us how important it is to be true to our values and to be able to stand up and defend. Well, I mean, to stand up for our Krishna consciousness, even when we are attacked by family members or anybody. I really thought that was so important for us to deeply uh, understand and uh, incorporate into our thinking and into our lifestyle. Um, on the question of dress, Guru Maharaj, for the ladies, is it important to cover the head? Um, it's not well, mm, that is considered a element of shyness, especially for those, yeah, especially for ladies. Um, that's been lost even within our society now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the most uh, outstanding and attractive quality of a woman is her shyness. Uh, so um, these, there are certain cultural principles, traits that's sort of enhanced that in the form of dress and the form of speech like that. Uh, we can name some in both categories, but yeah, like that. But the Vedic culture is, is seen to be old fashioned. It seems to be antiquated, outdated, women oppressive. <laughs> it has so many, what we say, uh, modern connotations thrown upon it like that but it's actually um, civilized life, but that's being lost. Yeah, so I would say, um, I don't even notice that anymore, but when I first joined, we were always hearing that all the time, how important it was and how much the, the women were encouraged to uh, keep their head covered like that. Uh, so um, I would suggest anyone, the women who do that, and it show it's a sign of chastity. So Srila Prabhupada, that the women, you know, are chaste and and cover their heads, and that's the uh, dress in the spiritual world. So we are encouraged to dress like that to to signify that we are devotees of Krishna, and this is the way we dress. Yeah, 
Yeah, Prabhupada gave it to us. He's giving us the Vedic culture. The Vedic culture includes all aspects of life, dress, eating, sleeping. It includes all aspects of bodily maintenance, bodily exhibitions. My god sister, um, um, she wrote an article one time, uh, how to 300 ways to become naked in a sari. <laughs> yeah, she wrote an article and then she was giving lectures to devotees in Mayapur on how women should dress. And it was quite, mm, I also attended one of the lectures just to see what was it about, was it about. And you'll see there was, she was getting a lot of, uh, 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 what we say, what's the word? Uh, a lot of mm, resistance. Because uh, there is a way to wear a sari in a very demure and a very proper way. Like that. And there's, I guess there are a few ways. I don't know much about this, but she she made she wrote a whole article and then started giving lectures on how women should dress, especially the young kids. Uh, they were just using it in a very licentious, not licentious, but you might say a very uh, covering the least amount as possible. <laughs> you see, the ladies in the Vedic culture, their dresses go all the way down to their to their ankles, yeah. and then they wear very colorful uh, top pieces. Her hairs are dressed with, hairs are decorated with flowers. Women look attractive, but in a nice way, not in a, not in a way to attract the opposite sex for sense gratification. So yeah, if, I guess we should follow, the woman should follow that. I agree with that. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm very appreciative of that and I will try to incorporate it. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Well, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't persecute anyone who is not following it. <laughs> I've seen that happen too. Women get really persecuted because they're not, they're not doing that. And then they start becoming discouraged and then they don't come around anymore. <laughs> So, it, uh, you know, I think that we should teach by example. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, we have Radha Vinodini Mataji raised her hand. Mataji, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to you. Uh, is it possible to, to find somewhere this article? Because now I just searched it on the internet. It, it really sounds interesting because uh, uh, many times I've heard this, that uh, if we protect Dharma, then Dharma will protect us. So I suppose it's, it's worth trying to, to, to follow this culture. Uh, which is uh, to some extent it's even lost. So I was just thinking that it, it might be an interesting article to read. You mean the article written by my god sister? Yes. You can contact her. Her name is Lakshmi Muni. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know Lakshmi Muni, right? Uh, she, she used to come, she comes to Slovenia and preaches sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. She's Thank a very, very, very senior Prabhupada disciple. Mm -hmm. She joined back in the 1960s, I think, 1968. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, contact uh, Lakshmi Moni. Um, 
if anybody, if you want her, uh, well, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm at liberty to give her email address away, but what I can do is I can contact her. I just wrote her a letter yesterday, in fact, and when she writes me back, I can ask her if she if she wants to make that article available. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare. Mm -hmm. And you can also search for it. I think it's called 300 Ways, 300 ways to be Naked in the Sari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just searched it on, on Google, but uh, some interesting things came. So I, I thought I. <laughs> I wouldn't try it anymore because maybe I didn't use the proper expression or something. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Careful. Thank you, Matushi. Um, are there any more questions, comments, or realizations? Please go ahead. After that question, everybody's silent. <laughs> Sri Devi shut the whole program down. <laughs> yes, Radha, you know the name that you have some more to share. Uh, yeah, yes, I I just another topic uh, so connected to, to what you you uh, spoke about that you mentioned that uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, seek for others approval. And um, I just had this feeling that sometimes uh, when we have this desire to, to uh, receive love, we just uh, mistake it with uh, different things like fame, like others' approval and, and stuff. Uh, so what can we do in this case that uh, there, is, there is something we are searching for and uh, not the proper ways? The question is how to discriminate in each and every situation on how one should act and how one should dress is that it uh no it's it's not really about this but uh, uh like uh, if if i have this uh, this feeling that i'm i'm looking for others approval what can i do about it uh, well we want to please others in such a way that they'll be attracted to krishna that's why Prabhupada said mm -hmm. yeah the gopis dress nicely because it pleases Krishna. Uh, so if we, our motivation is not to attract people to ourselves, but to attack people, attract people to Krishna consciousness, or attract people to become become interested in Krishna consciousness. So there is a certain behavior that should be adopted, a certain way to dress that is more beneficial for attracting people. All of these things should be in, in one's consideration. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, and of course, as ladies, ladies always li like to look nice. So that consideration should always be there. Uh, I like when the ladies look very nicely, but not, not flashy or gaudy or try or and making a display, but looking nice, neat, clean, colorful. And how is it possible to notice uh, these, uh, when there are some subtle ways of uh, uh, one seeking others attention, but uh, you know, sometimes yeah. uh, we can see that devotees say that, yeah, this is for Krishna and this is the mercy of the guru and stuff, but but still there is some kind of subtle uh, desire for... Uh, for um... yeah. That may be there, we have to be, that's maybe hard to detect. But 
the, I guess the indication is if you don't get the reciprocation you want, then you feel unhappy. <laughs> That's an indication that you're moving to, in toward more toward your personal ego rather than uh, just following the proper norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really true. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Uh, Namrata Matashi, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Maharaj, my question is about feminism. Uh, which itself is a very wide topic, but um, I would like to just ask that uh, even in ISKCON now, uh, there are some Matajis who uh, they want, they are like, I don't know, they, that is a feminist factor or uh, with, uh, it, is, it is the they want what? What do, what do they want? I missed the word you said. Yeah, there are uh, ladies in Iskon as well who would like to call themselves Prabhujis rather than Matajis. Mm -hmm. so, um, well, okay. there is. Um, you'll find if you if you check Srila Prabhupada's letters. He did refer to women sometimes as Prabhu in the letter. Uh, but he didn't make that a, a policy. Um, it's not that you be you should want to be called Prabhu, but if you call a lady Prabhu, it's not it's not wrong. I think it's if you want that, if you want that, it's somewhat you know outside of the proper behavior. But the idea is within the context of Vaishnavas, we see each other as Prabhu. So that includes both men and women, and not just men. So Prabhupada used that. He referred to at least four or five different occasions in letters, and he also said it. He called the lady Prabhu. Well, which means that Prabhu means master or one that means I am your servant. When you refer to someone as Prabhu, that means I am your servant. That's what it means. So uh, it's a title that can be used to be given to both men and women, but it's not something that, well, if you don't call me Prabhu, then you you know you're in Maya. <laughs> That's not the idea. That's false ego. You see the point? Yes, Maharaj. See the point. Yeah. yeah. We shouldn't go around wanting it. We should think, but if someone calls a lady Prabhu, it's not outside of the culture, it's not outside of the etiquette. Okay, so if a lady is called a Prabhu, then it's the position she has earned and not, you know, the... No, well, it's not a matter of a position in, within the society. It's simply, this is the reference within the Vaishnava culture. Everyone sees everyone else as Prabhu. But Prabhupada, when Prabhupada... Um, uh, when one lady asked Prabhupada, you can hear it on the recording, Prabhupada said, <clears throat> the lady was saying, yes, as ladies, we refer to men as Prabhu. Um, and uh, what was she saying? No, he, no, um, no, it was the opposite. Prabhupada said the men should see the woman as mother. Yeah. Mother. And when, then what then, so what did, uh, 
what Prabhupada said, then she asked, well, how, if the men should see women as mother, how should women see men? And Prabhupada said, as son. So that's, that's the mood. Then it's more uh, respectful and it's more affectionate. Uh, referring to woman as mother means that, um, you know, it's, it's a title of respect because mother is considered to be a very respectable position. Of course, that's been lost by modern civilization. But in the Manu Samhita, it talks about that the, the highest position in, the, in society is Krishna. He is number one. And number two is, is one's mother. Mother is two. Father is considered to be third. So, so women, a mother is higher than father within the context of family. Mm -hmm. She is the nurturing factor. She is the one that gives life or brings it brings forth life anyway, and then nurtures life. So the, so the principle of respect is there also. So now, nowadays, a lot of ladies don't like to be called mother. They think that's kind of like demeaning or something. And the devotees don't use the term in a proper way. When you, if you refer to ladies who are growing up in India as mother, they delight in that. It's respectful. They understand it. If you take an Indian lady who's been growing up in the West and you call her mother, she's thinking, what is she saying, you know? <laughs> What is he saying? So um, this is very, uh, what we say, uh, it's something that's going on now. It's, um, so I think the idea is to be respectful to every devotee. That's the idea. The terminology we use is, is an indication of respect. Everyone should be treated with respect. When you don't, when you lose respect towards someone, you lose respect towards Krishna within the heart of that person also. Because Krishna sits in the heart. So we have terminologies, yeah. So men generally refer to each other as Prabhu. Women refer to, can also refer to each other as Prabhu or as Mother Mataji like that. But the idea is that terminology is used with respect and not just simply throwing the word out in a very, you know, loose way. Maharaj, I, I guess these uh, controversies are maybe relating to or going deeper to the roots where uh, the Matajis, because the Matajis are not, uh, you know, allowed to take sannyas or give initiation. So that is why they uh, they are they may be. Uh, this is the effects of, of Western civilization. <laughs> a woman is glorious when she acts in her position as a woman. But she's not given the facility nor the treatment. In the secular society, they take women out of the home. Women think to stay. Women think to stay in the home and be a housewife is a very demeaning and very narrow form of lifestyle. It doesn't allow them to grow properly, so they have to go out and get a job and, and do everything the men are doing. And that's the that's the reason why the whole world is upside down. As soon as you cut the bonds of the of, of women within society and throw them into the thing, then the whole society is finished. And that's what's happening. It's been happening for a while. And women are actually exploited in the workplace. Prabhupada said, women's liberation was created by men to simply to exploit women. He said, it's not coming from women. Men created that in order to break the social bonds of women and to use them both 
as prostitutes and as uh, as uh, cheap labor in the workforce. You know. But everything's upside down now. So the only thing you, the only thing you can do is become Krishna conscious. <laughs> if you try to try to readjust all of these things, go back to the Vanashram system, it's not possible. Things are so upside down, it's impossible to reset it properly. All you can do is become Krishna conscious. Then you can transcend all of these bodily situations. So Maharaj, uh, women is, uh, you know, designed in a way that uh, they are not supposed to take sannyas. Am I right? Uh, it's not recommended, but women can also practice, uh, also take official form of renunciation. Now, when they retire from their family responsibilities, the children are grown up, the husband is also um, in their... Uh, when they get older, women can go to holy places and live there in a very renounced form. You'll see that. You know that in India, there's ashrams of women. They live like that. And there's also, they also put on white to indicate, you know, no more, uh, no more activities in the material world. So white is a renunciation color for the ladies like that. So they don't, there's no need for formal sannyas. They can do it within the context of renunciation from all of their material responsibilities and focus 100% on Krishna consciousness. So generally, we say when women come to that stage, they go to a holy place such as Vrindavan, Mayapur, or some Jagannath Puri or some holy places and then serve the Lord, serve the deity of the Lord until the end of life, and then go back home, back to Godhead. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So uh, by this process, by the renunciation, what you're uh, saying is recommended for uh, women in, in the one oppressed classroom. So with, with that, they get uh, another life as a, a, a male life or Not they can get they can also go back home but they can also go back to Godhead it's not that they have to go from women to men and then go back to Godhead that's if they st still have a little attachment to this material world then they may take birth as a man then but if, there, if there's no attachment left, then they're fully Krishna conscious. The highest form of uh, devotion is exhibited by the gopis of Rindava. And they were simple cowherd girls. That's I don't, I, I don't understand why, why then females are rebelling. Because if you have this facility that with, you can live with renunciation and still get uh, liberation, then why rebelling? Why feminism? I really don't understand. It's, it's the effects of Western civilization. They've been, they've been afflicted and affected by this propaganda. And, and there's, they're seen, and they, they think they're second class citizens, just like India. India is going through a whole change now. The Western society is telling India, you know, you've been in the Stone Age for so long, you need to get out and be like us, you know, get jobs, have big cars, nice highways, big houses, and uh, have all the, you know, the sense gratification that you've been missing for the last, you know, three, three or four millenniums, you know. But if you go back to Vedic culture, just study Vedic culture with village life during, not even after Krishna times. The women were very, very influential in the villages. They were not just workers or mothers. They also had says in what went on in the village. They were respected. 
Well, it's this modern civilization with all the cars and highways and computers and this all the thing. It's just uprooted everyone from their actual natural position and especially women. And they brainwash people to think you have to be, you know, you have to have money, you have to have cars, you have to have nice clothes, you have to have so many computers, you have to, and if you have to have a, a, a computer and if it's more than two years old, you're, you, you need to get a new one. And my computer right now is more than seven years old, it still works. <laughs> I hope it still works after this class too. <laughs> so, but yeah, you, you, we're all brainwashed by this civilization. <laughs> yes, Mara. Yes, Guru Maharaj. I remember from from your uh, computer uh, i can remember my father kept a refrigerator at my place since 20 years it was like <laughs> 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 at the end everybody was like okay you have to give it to the museum now no more uh, no nothing more can come out of this but still he he used to you know repair it and drag it till the last breath of the refrigerator <laughs> Prabhupada talks about Vedic culture. There was no such thing as refrigerators. Whatever they produced, they ate in one day. They didn't store anything. <laughs> they used, they, they produced, used it in one day or distributed if they had extra. And there was no need for refrigeration. <laughs> now I go into houses, I open up the refrigerator and half of the stuff falls out. <laughs> it's like they got things stocked into the shelf. And he got stuff in the back that nobody's seen for the last three months. It's there. You start cleaning it out, you find some kind of strange stuff in there. You, nobody ever knows what it is. It's been there since time immemorial. Our, our whole civilization is dysfunctional. It's killing the aesthetic, moral, spiritual, and physical values of the people. People's health are going down, psychological problems, disenfranchise, drug addiction, alcoholism, broken homes. I mean, and, I mean, you, it's the whole civilization is dysfunctional. Why? Because it's based on the wrong principle. It's based on I am this body and sense gratification is the goal of life in economic Gain is the way to increase sense gratification. It's, just, it's a very dysfunctional, very insane, Prabhupada said, it is, it is a soul-killing society. Modern civilization. I, I give you an example. I just, I just traveled from... Uh, I tried to travel. I traveled from one side of London to the other on Monday. It took me five hours to travel from one side. And there was an accident on the highway. They blocked the whole highway. Cars were stopped for three to four hours. We were hardly even moving. Right, Sukhava? You were, you were there also. Huh? Uh, it was such a disaster. And finally, I left my, I left my, the place I left was at 4.30 and the ride was actually two hours, but the accident and the way they handled the whole thing was uh, I got, I got to my place at about nine o'clock. <laughs> well, I didn't, I was sitting in the car reading a book, you know, I couldn't do anything else. We couldn't even move. <laughs> We're sitting in, we're just sitting in traffic, burning up gasoline. It's a, it's a very dysfunctional society. It's completely dysfunctional. Ralph said we have our, we have our Mayapur, we have our Vrindavan. He said we have, he said Mayapur is our place of residence. It is the center of our society. 
He said, these farm communities based on simple living and devotional service to Krishna, this is civilization. Every day people die in car accidents. Every day people are, you know, people's homes are being robbed. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's, it's crazy. You live in an apartment, you have to have three or four locks on the door, you know. Especially if, those of you who live in London, we got a few Londonites here. This is one of the highest areas in the world for burglaries. So many burglaries in London, right, Kanchana? <laughs> so everybody's house gets burglarized. <laughs> It's a crazy society. It's, it's just why? Because there's no there's no direction. And the thing is, it's going to collapse sooner or later. It's going to collapse. The whole thing's going to fall. It's already breaking at the seams right now because it's it has nothing to do with human values. It's a rakshasha society. Prabhupada said it's it's run by demons. <laughs> Yes, Maharaj. I think that reminds me of Prabhupada's statement when he says that just finish your business here and you know go back home back to God. Eh? He said, Yeah, if you stick around, come back, and Kali Yuga is only going to get worse. <laughs> you, yeah, but Prabhupada gave the formula farm communities, simple living, cow protection. Agriculture. Wow. He gave the formula. You know, spiritual education. Prabhupada drew, Prabhupada covered every area of society when he presented Krishna consciousness accordingly from all angles of vision. It wasn't just the philosophical knowledge of Shastra. He taught us how to live. <laughs> we were using toilet paper until we, <laughs> until we, until we came in contact with Prabhupada. <laughs> when, the, when the lockdown, this is, a, I mean, this, is a, this was hilarious. When the lockdown came in America, they cleaned out the shelves of toilet paper in all the stores. It was the fastest thing that went. Food even went slower than toilet paper. I'm, ser I'm serious. One devotee sent me a joke. It was, it was a joke, but it il illustrate what was going on. Two people are playing poker they're play and they're gambling. And, the, and, the, and the, the, the bet is rolls of toilet paper. So I have that little cartoon. It was illustrating of what was going on. So, you know, this is our society. It's completely upside down. It doesn't make sense. You know? Insane. When I was in New Vrindavan, we were cooking with wood. Then they came up with, you know, and then later on somebody started gas. So now cooking with gas. Now we're cooking with electricity. It's just destroying the ozone, cooking with electricity. Well, I said first class cooking is cow dung. Second, wood. Third, gas. Fourth, electricity. Mm -hmm. Cow dung, you know, keep cows, you, you dry up, you, you take the, the, the cow dung, you mix it with patty. You dry it out, put it in your stove, and not only do you cook nicely, but it gives a nice aroma too. Prabhupada, I just talked, listen to Prabhupada this morning. He was talking about the beauty of cow dung and how people in India they take their they cover their whole walls and floors with cow dung, right? Yeah, they use that for a base for covering the floors and the walls. Now we got these cheap tiles that break. <laughs> it 
plastic. Now even the money's becoming plastic. Did you notice that? Those of you who live in the UK, the money's plastic now. There's no more paper, it's plastic. <laughs> plastic money, that's the actual national currency now. We went from gold coins to alloy, to paper, to now plastic. <laughs> What's next? Next thing is they're gonna get rid of all, all kinds of currency and they're gonna just make digital currency. And that's the, next, that's the next formula for the society. Everything's digital. You don't have to worry about you know, your paper money anymore, plastic money. Your bank account is something you read on the screen. That's how, that's how much you have. <laughs> Yes, Mara, the, the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoins are the example of that. They're already doing it. Canada's yes. pushing it. Canada's advertising it now as a way to go. So we have to understand we live in a very, very soul-killing, dysfunctional, uh, uh, very unhealthy society. Very unhealthy physically unhealthy, mentally disturbing. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for the deeper insight. <laughs> I could go on all day with this, but I don't want to, I don't want to harangue you anymore. So. Mara, Mara, this topic is really very deep and very vast, but you know, yes, other, other devotees are lined up with questions, so I don't want to take up their time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your inspiring, a very important topic. <laughs> Shri Devi Mataji, uh, do you have anything to share? Please go ahead. Yeah, Guru Maharaj, you know, India's culture, India's uh, Vedic civilization has been such a uh, wonderful way for both men and women to attain Krishna consciousness. But uh, today, a survey of all the nations in the world, they say India is the most dangerous place for women to be in. The atrocities against women are the highest in India most of which do not go recorded or informed to the police because the victims are too frightened or they're even killed. In fact, the government at one time took out a law that within seven years, if a young bride dies um, under mysterious circumstances, automatically the husband and the in-laws will be thrown into jail because of dowry death. They have to prove that they are not guilty because the dowry debts were so high that it was assumed that they have either poisoned her or thrown uh, kerosene over her and set her on fire and uh, you know finished her off because of not bringing enough dowry. So the atrocities against women, the abuse against women is horrendous in India and uh, foreign tourists, especially women, are warned not to be alone with Indian men, not to be alone in a hotel room, not to go anywhere with Indian men because uh, the, the men commit so many atrocities against women. That's just what I wanted to say because Namrata was pointing out, oh, women rebel and rebel this, but uh, that's a backlash against what's being done to the women. Uh, husbands, fathers uh, are not really taking care of the girl child. In fact, the highest rate of abortions was for female infanticide because it was a girl child. The abortions were taking place because they didn't want uh, her, the mother to have a girl child. So they mm -hmm. were killing the baby in the womb. Yeah, I, uh, someone's knocking at my door. I'll be right back in one minute. Yeah, India's 
trying to copy the West. And of course, this women abuse is, goes back many, many decades. It's not something new. And um, India is also one of the highest rates of heart attack in the world. It's also one of the highest rates of car accidents and deaths by car accidents in the world. So yeah, the, the Vedic culture is being uprooted. And but Prabhupada said it's not possible that India can be modernized like the Western civilization, he said. Because the culture, the atmosphere, the environment, everything is contrary to uh, developing as the, as the Western cultures have, have developed. So therefore, India, India will suffer the most as they try to follow the Western lifestyle, even more than the Westerners. And you're giving, you're getting some of the results right now. This is just a small part. It's, it's already happening now. Now, Prabhupada said, India's material advancement is artificial. It's artificial. And the results are, yeah, exploitation, uh, drug addiction, crime, all of these things are coming more and more faster into India than ever before. I, I've, been, I've been going to India since 1993, I think. No, actually. I first went to India in 1986, but then after that, I think I, the next year I went was 1993, 90. And I've seen how the culture has changed so drastically that it's quite uh, horrifying when you see how it's changed. <laughs> yeah. the Western society has really attacked India really hard. And what, what is the main weapon they used? They tried for years, like years ago, they tried to replace the cows with tractors, but that didn't work. And they tried other ways to bring India into a more modern type of lifestyle, according to the Western standard. That didn't work. But then they found the secret, television. Television came in and that did it. Bollywood television, and then they threw that and people start becoming attracted and enamored. And then a whole different culture of life, lifestyle started to be pervaded, not only as entertainment, but as a way of life. And now in the last 20 or 30 years, no, no, more than that, 40 years, India is really becoming abominable in some ways. Yeah, because it's not meant to go in that direction. It's, it's the seed of Vedic culture. And if you go to the villages in many of the remote areas, the Vedic culture is still intact in many areas. It's mostly in the big cities where everything is you know, upside down. Yeah, so, well, the whole world's going to hell anyway. And then Prabhupada said, this Lord Chaitanya's movement is the only thing that can save the world. And he said, it will save the world. Prabhupada said, but he said, the, the Lord Chaitanya's movement will save the world in its darkest hour. So it's gonna get darker and darker and darker. But at the same time, Lord Chaitanya is pushing his devotees forward, to take responsibilities to change the world. 
because we have the formula, we have the lifestyle, we have the knowledge, we have the philosophy, and we also have the resources, uh, gaining the resources. And intelligent people are following, at least to some degree. It's not that we have to go back to a complete Vedic simplistic lifestyle. We just have to present Krishna consciousness as the foundation for the values and the activities we perform in, in the world. In other words, um, for, like we use an example, uh, people earn money. Why? So they owe more money, more facilities, more opportunities for power, sense gratification. So our model, our model for earning money is earn with integrity, spend with compassion. That's the Krishna conscious model. Earn with integrity, spend with compassion. So we're trying to infiltrate the society from different places within the society and place spiritual values within the society and gradually work from the inside out and move people closer and closer to spiritual values and then gradually give them Krishna consciousness. We're starting on the values level, principles, values, So that's our movement, at least, and it's working in some places around the world quite good. And Prabhupada's books are the foundation by which we do everything in Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada said, everything you need to know, I'll read it here. I, I got it. The statement is right there. I'm in a, a wonderful devotee's apartment. Her name is Brenda. She's so kindly let me use her apartment while she's going to be going away on, on her uh, trip to see her spiritual master. But it says here, and she puts these nice quotes on the wall. I'm really enchanted by here. And it says, this is one by, it says, whatever I have wanted to say, I have said in my books. If I live, I will say something a little more. If you want to know me, Read my books. If you are strong in your position by reading books, Vedic literature, then you become very, very favorite to Krishna. Bhagavat is the only guide. Read Bhagavat repeatedly, life, safe, always, always. Whenever there is time, read, read, read. These are statements by Prabhupada. So Prabhupada put everything in his books. especially the Bhagavatam. Okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for all this question and answer session. Uh, so much, there was so much to learn today. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any more devotees who would like to ask any question or share realizations? I will, I will go, Dave. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture with so much interesting points. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for living in Mayapur. That's thanks to you. And that's the biggest wonderful point. Thank you very much. Okay. Please, 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 in, please invite some of the other ladies to join you. Sukabaha, Mayapur. <laughs> I always try to have them here. <laughs> not yet, not yet, not yet. Soon. <laughs> Thank you 
you so much. Alpha said that Mayapur is our head headquarters in the world. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisance. This is all good to share with us. Thank you so much uh, for a very nice class and nice discussion. Um, I just want to um, remind you about tomorrow's class. Um, that is with the Iskand Harrisburg devotees class, Guru Maharaj. Uh, the topic is Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, tenth chapter, eight words, one point ten point eight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So it will be twelve p.m. UK time. And uh, seven o'clock Eastern and uh, six at six o'clock Central. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. All right, so we'll see you all tomorrow with Srimad Bhagavatam one ten eight. Okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for today's class and your time and association. I also thank all the devotees for joining today. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Rinda. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. What are you going to cook for me? <laughs> what do you want to eat, Guru Maharaj? Kitchri. <laughs> Kitchri, okay. I'll get it. That's all I can eat nowadays. <laughs> Sure. Soup. <laughs> <It's true>. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. Krishna Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. I thank you all the devotees. I will end the call. Hare Krishna. Mataji, please stop recording. Yes. <laughs>